so much for being here. Congratulations on a beautiful film. Uh, whenever I people as accomplished as you all, I, I'd love to start at the beginning and ask, what was your first job in this business? You know, did you start as like a runner on a film set, or were you directing and writing movies right right out of the gate? I, I studied computer engineering. You know what? Woo! <laughs> yeah, shout out computer engineering. <laughs> but I didn't finish it. I always wanted to make movies since I was a kid. Since I was eight, I was in my short movies and my old movies and things like that. So I really wanted to do it. So when I started doing computers, I found a couple of friends that were crazy like me that they wanted to be actors. And so we started doing like a lot of short movies while we were studying that. And then there was a moment when I decided that it was, it was making any no sense at all. So I, that's how I did my first feature film, but it was uh, completely self-financed and self-produced and completely experimental and like how film that that was somehow my school. That's how I started learning everything. That's so what, what was your first feature? It's called Nomad. That was your first? Yes. Oh wow. 2001. Oh my gosh, I thought you had maybe done some other features before that. It's so accomplished, I wouldn't have guessed that. You saw that movie? I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was my first piece. I, I did a couple of short movies before uh, in film because I wanted to learn the film process. So I was doing the camera and like, changing the magazines. I was trying to learn all the things because I never had the luxury to go to film school. So I wanted to learn all those things. And, um, and yes, that was my first feature film. And then I did another one that it was more independent with a very small crew called Over the Rainbow that yeah. we showed in Berlin. And with Emily Bear, that's she's actually here, one, oh, of, the act, one of the actresses of the movie. Oh, yeah. so great. Um, so uh, I was always learning by doing. And Ian, for you, what was your first job as an actor? Whether you know, it was the first time you got paid for it, or you felt you could call yourself uh, a professional? I was still at drama school, and uh, <laughs> uh, my my friend that uh, John Hill was leaving to do a movie. He was a term ahead of me, and they couldn't cast this. Part in lead in this movie of this angry 19 year old North Country student. So it was obviously, good enough. now I had no chance to get in that part. <laughs> and I did, I went, I went and tested for him, took a bus out to Palmer Studios, and did a film test, and they offered me the part. So I went back to drama school, they said, I lied, sir. I didn't go to the dentist. I went to do a film test. And they offered me the part. And he said, you know, he said, well, you realize if you do this, we won't give you your certificate. So I said, a certificate to act, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we did get it, and it was the Royal Academy. It was Sir John Hill would sign it, and later on we got to work together. So things worked out very well. Did he make a good film? We made another one together, which you want to check out, called The Hollow Point. Yes. Which is a pretty good Western noir movie, but got lost in distribution in hell. So this time, about a year after that, excuse me for taking over. No, please. Point, I'm not here. It was one of those things that, you know, it doesn't seem that long ago. It was about eight, eight, nine years ago. And then he called me up, and we remained friends after this movie. You know? And we talked, and he said, I've got this script, and it was written by a friend, it was Nacho. All they had was, it was a hitman, Malabo Wilson. And then we met, we talked about it, and over the next five years, it sort of developed, and the skip got rich, and he was there, and we talked occasionally. And then I did a movie called Jawbone with Mike Elliott, terrific independent producer, and uh, it was like the last piece of the puzzle. Mike came in, we talked about it, we made, we made this film together, Jawbone, and then he introduced him to Gonzalo, and, and the money came in, and suddenly two years ago, we found ourselves in a position to make the movie. And um, it's very thrilling to be a part of it and to have the, the, the sort of the, the it, it doesn't get stale. It's the old movie story. You never you want to make a movie, and we got to make the movie that we wanted to make. Yeah. Nobody looking over your shoulder, nobody telling you what to do. Six weeks, and you know, as you see, it's just a normal package to holiday film. <laughs> <laughs> Five weeks and four days. I mean, we were, then we did some camera tests and rehearsals, yes. and then yes. we started making it. <laughs> yeah. And in your producer, twenty-five days shooting. Yes. You're a producer on this film as well. Well, that's why because I've been done it at the beginning, and I brought him in, and we we talked about the script. Natural worked on it. 
And then I brought Mike in, and then, yeah, we learned about things. Terry Smith, who's our main sort of part that Pedro, the Spanish producer. I mean, it very, it came together with an extraordinary Yeah, they didn't do many yeah. years. For two years. Well, yeah. And apparently just in time, because the American star sank, didn't it? Yes, yeah, this, this year is the 30th anniversary of, it, of, of the moment when it got stuck there. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> And it, it sunk already. I mean, I never had the chance to see it myself. Oh, you're kidding. No, I just saw pictures of it. Oh, my I know a lot of people that saw it because it completely sunk, I think it was 2006 or seven. So when we, when we started uh, scouting, it was it was already just a little thing you could see. You know? <laughs> Nothing really spectacular. So now it is as it looks at the end of the movie with the final yeah. shot, the drone shot. That's how you can see it now. So you had to recreate what it looked like. Yes. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, I am curious. Um, I know they shot uh, actually where you live as well, Puerto mm -hmm. Ventura. I don't live in that island. I live in Gran Canaria. Okay. Um, but yes, it's uh, when I went there, I discovered that those islands are unique and are amazing. But it has nothing to do with the fact that I live there. It, it is because of the American star, mm -hmm. and we were looking for that metaphor, that mirror where Wilson see his own life and his own reflection, and we found that the ship was that perfect element for it. And it happened that was in, in Fuerteventura, and Fuerteventura is an island with a lot of personality, with these scars in the ground, and this greediness, and that was also telling a lot of things of the character. It's part of the movie, I mean, right. it's, it's not a cartoon. an important part of the movie. As is the photography by Jose David, who he's worked with forever. So, uh, he's one of your I mean, it's a very formalistic way. Of, I love it, the way they, you know, the A to B black dissolves, and then you get the one point of the other. He'll talk technically, but it's um, also the way you work with actors. I mean, the great example, Thomas is here tonight, Crash, right? Oh, right. That film, the, the, the end scene, which, you know, Thomas and Sabella created again, another sort of people who you instantly sort of think, recognize. So often that's thrown away, it seems like that, but it becomes important. And it becomes important for the, the entire ending. And throughout that happened, with, you know, with Oscar and with Nora, and uh, happy circumstances, you know, that happen along the way, happy accidents. In a way, when people work, you know, you find out uh, 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 the Spanish actress who was going to play the part originally was, was Elena. Yes, Elena had to drop out. Well, we had to do the creative commitment and we had a time period to make the movie. You know, it's financial, sometimes you do before they move the money around somewhere. Else. Yes. <laughs> uh, but it was, but it, you know, and Nora came in and, we, and she was a lot younger than. Elena was, and they, they could have been smart with Elena, but this was different because there couldn't be that relationship and he had to translate to something else. And I think she was great, you know, I pulled it up and the great funny how down playing the mother, that very ambiguous scene, whatever. But it's four days of, you know, I, it does what good movies do, I think. You know, you go to the cinema, you sit down, the lights go down, and you go to another place with another people who you might recognize, you might not. And then the lights go up and you think, wow, that was, was life. Mm -hmm. Good so, speaking of your co-stars, um, I want to talk about mm -hmm. your co-stars. I want to speak about this young actor, Oscar Coleman. Oh, yeah. Who is yeah. fantastic. And I, I think I heard that a lot of your dialogue with him was improvised. Mm -hmm. Well, the basis was there, but with any scene which is physical and kind of wind and according to time constraints, I mean, we filmed that. The first scene, both the times of the day when you have a certain period of time to do it. The second scene of the magic hour on the roof, and then the scene in the early morning uh, when when he wakes up. But he was just, it was great. I mean, I, I met him and his dad first day, and he's one of those kids. He's very, again, Eddie Maddie. He's like, oh, he's very cool, isn't he? Just went with the flow, and I went with the flow. 
he acts like a kid. Oh, good. You know, yeah, he yeah. behaves and acts. He was normal. He, he wasn't was an acting kid, you know, like. Yeah, he was not acting like normal. He didn't kid. say, I'd like to discuss my character before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't even that. It's not like, you know, like when they pretend that they are acting and they, yes. they look like, like adults, you yeah. know, and then it, it doesn't work because it's something that I'm watching and he was just being a nice. Do, do you think he was intimidated? Did he know who you not were? Not at all. Really? Okay. He was not intimidated. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> why would you want to make him feel, you know? No, I mean, like, he bends oh, sorry, the mic. talking to you, you know? The mic. Sorry, he bends it. He bends it all go, boom, boom, through his uh, mask. And he was quiet. He was just, he's a normal kid who's asked to do something. He ain't normal, like, like, hopefully I did, you know? You know what I'm <laughs> No, no, I'm not acting. You know, you get up and you get up, you do and it's, it's the magic moment is over and you start again. You've played so many different roles, but I think we kind of associate you with, with very loquacious verbal characters, you know, obviously like Deadwood or Shakespeare or something like that. Was it challenging to play someone who's so internal and saying so little? Well, be, because he's told to this point of view, I mean, there's no need for the dialogue. I mean, we we had we had the the opportunity to, to be there four days before we started actual filming, and two days which we sat around and rehearsed with the cast and went through the script and cut away most of what wasn't necessary and, and filmed the emotion of the stuff with, like, Adam, the emotional scene when he tells me about what who she is, whatever. We found out that so on the day there was no wasted time arguing about the script, and I was like, and as it's told from Wilson's point of view, you just got to trust yourself, the camera, and you know, a certain amount of experience having done it for a while, it's kind of nice not to suddenly go, oh, God, here I go again. <laughs> <laughs> what a monologue. <laughs> no, I mean, a monologue, a monologue, but no, sometimes it's nice to just you know, be there and. I'm always the key to any acting is listening anyway, you know, and it's even better when you, you play a character that, you know, commits the cardinal rule of disobeying his own rules. And there lies disaster, it's like inevitability, but he goes into it with, hey, you know, it's, he knows in a sense, but it's kind of drawn into something else. And that's the, the whole, something here, the music's great. The soundscape is great, you know, the silence, the night that closed the car. It's a very, it's, he knows how to make a movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the trouble is when you watch, you know, as I do, you have to watch the, you know, to vote. My God, is it sometimes, you know, for the first second, isn't it, but you still got to watch stuff. <laughs> but it's fascinating. I love movies, you know. I love it. it's what you do. And I also love watching them and seeing them. And each time, you know, a little more comes out, you know. It was my first time watching it with an audience. Are you serious? Yeah, man. Me too, on a big screen, yeah, but it was kind of like uh, saying, you know, we'll be okay. I just saw it in the app. I was going to say, you've obviously seen the movie, but you haven't been like this before. That year, in both we saw it. It's amazing. Uh, it looked beautiful here, by the way, but especially yeah. those last scenes. I was kind of disconnecting sometimes, yeah. I'm just enjoying it. Well, you should! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually curious, um, something that I love about the film technically is um, all these over-the-shoulder shots. It really is Wilson's point of view. Um, the, your director of photography, I wanted to give him a shout out, is it Jose David Montero? Um, fantastic work. Did you have conversations about how this would all be from Wilson's point of view, mostly? Yes, that was pretty much the, the whole process of designing the style of the movie was thinking about the character and how we could respect that point of view. Uh, so I wanted to be always with him, so the way we do the angles is always, as he said, over the shoulder, all what he sees, but we never break the rules of showing him through another's characters uh, over the shoulder, you know. So when you create those rules, then you have the beautiful chance of breaking that rule yeah. in a specific moment because you want to tell something specific or something different. So I believe that every detail that you really 
paid attention and you work on it accurately, then somehow gets a reward when you watch it. So when I told him about it, then he had the idea of choosing just one lens and doing the whole movie with one lens. So that was again giving some kind of style, you know, after the, when you watch it all together, you don't know what it is, but it's one of the things that adds to that style is the fact that we just went with one lens and also was helping us on set to be faster. So we were not ever arguing of whether you use a 50 or 75 or something, it was just the lens that we use. And if you want to get closer, get closer. <laughs> and that was, those kind of restrictions in the end, it makes you, I don't know, more, finding more creative solutions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, then we know from this movie what happens when you break rules. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes exactly. You had to stick with that. Well, what lens did you use? I'm going to say. <laughs> Can I guess? Yes. I can't. I don't know. It was wide angle, but the, the, the lens we used had a lot of distortions, so the, the, was, the 24 was impossible to use, so we just used the next one. And, um, yeah. Wow, it looks beautiful. Um, Ian, I'm curious because as an actor, you probably pick up different skills from set to set um, you know, that you can continue to use. You've obviously worked in the world of hitmen before. <laughs> Did you find that your work in, you know, John Wick or even Deadwood informed this character's world at all? No, I, I, I think it's like, uh, like anything, you know, if you, I mean, this is a, a lot of twist, but like, take playing golf, like, which I hate. <laughs> my father, no, my, my father was a soccer player, but no, I, I really hated golf, but if you ask me to play a round of golf, it's awful, but if you ask me to hit through, a three iron on screen, it would look like Tiger Woods. <laughs> so because you master that technique for a second, for two minutes. So you, you pick up a kind of a, 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 a sort of a, an overlook of a skill, whatever, or a technique, or a trick. I, golf's not a sport, is it? <laughs> but I mean, like that, I picked that example because I've done that. You think, oh yeah, because you, do that. you pick up certain skills and you look good and you make it as simple as possible. Um, the hitman, yeah, I mean, John, no, thank God, I, I said, just give me a gun, I'm not going in there, close quarter fighting, thank you. <laughs> My Muay Thai, you know. <laughs> um, no, it's fun, but it, it's like playing that guy, it, I mean, it could be anything. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking, it was, you know, I was thinking about Wilson tonight, watching it as well as being an actor, how many times I've spent in a hotel room as an actor waiting to do a job. You know, sometimes feel on some jobs like you are. A hitman, it's a good one. You walk, you come into town on a movie, you do two days, you hope it perks up the, the dreary film sometimes, it may be you may. But your job is to sort of give it grab its house and a kick, and then you get out of town. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's some, yeah. some movies, yeah, that's, that's what you do. But on this, it's like Wilson anticipates his first rule, which is go in, you know, it's the rule, what, you know, it's made famous in heat, but it's true in the movie, you know, like the, the nearest is. Don't be anywhere where you can't get out of there in 30 seconds, which is absolutely true. But when you disobey your own rule, you're fucked. <laughs> in many ways. And you are, but it's the journey to that being fucked that is the <laughs> amazing part of what this is, which is and so many other people's lives are dependent on it. And they come across, a, they're not sort of sketches, they're people that have touched each other in a weird way. This can happen. Only in, not only in movies, they happen all the time in life. I mean, you read the most... Well, it is. Truth is stranger than big. When you read, you see, when you see some of those unsolved mysteries, you know, whatever you check, I don't mind. Wow, people are really wacko. <laughs> they are. They're much crazier than you think they are. And most people think, that could never happen. You go, yes, you can. And then you have but this is the way he's made a, you know, we've made a really lovely film about, you know, it's about life, it's about age, it's about life, it's about death, it's about accidents, it's about deliberate acts of, you know, about what did you do with your life, where did you go wrong, or whatever, or you look back on it, all that stuff. And then you've got the character of Oscar, which represents hope and love and whatever, gives him some strange advice, but it's true advice, you know, to the moment. I don't really enjoy the good zone. <laughs> <laughs> Why does he break that rule? I mean, it's his last job. You know, oh, he's still, I, something about the atmosphere, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> <laughs> so you made the movie. 
<laughs> I think you, you're getting, well, he is getting wiser, old, and, and he's not the one he used to be. He's not Brian anymore. That's why we need Brian in the movie, so he can understand how he was and what he did to him. You know, he, he became a, a monster. Um, so I think that's why maybe the fact that he's a hitman or whatever, it's secondary. It, it is about getting to an age where you think about what you did yeah. in your life. You really took the right decisions, you really did what you wanted to do, and you enjoyed that life. Um, and that island makes him reflect on that, makes him think about all those things. Because also, also it's an island that that makes you think, you know, and the fact that you go to a place and have dinner and you hear Julio Iglesias singing and like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, it makes you think about those songs when I was a young, you know, like a kid in the 70s or... Um, so he gets involved in all those, I don't know, mood and, you know, and, and the fact that he can walk around wearing his star suit and nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. You know, he can be the hitman between the tourists yeah. and nobody cares at all. And he really feels like uh, he missed something. Yeah. Um, I do want to take a couple quick questions from the audience if we have some. Um, we just have a couple minutes, but if you have one, just raise your hand. We'll start right there. Oh. Uh, so who's your favorite director? Oh, who's your favorite director and not counting the person who's sitting here? <laughs> uh, favorite director? You mean uh, who I've worked with or to watch? Oh, to work with or to watch? I've worked with? Oh, I've worked with a few gems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you mean favorite director? I work with on Chad's, right? On the Wick films. Chad oh. has got better. No, I mean, there's an example of a director that got better and better and better and better. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought the last John Wick movie, which I felt was thinking, I got two hours, 45 minutes to sit there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, and two, when we sat there, my wife is a very, very good. We sat there, it was like, no, he's a, he made a really terrific movie. He really did. I mean, for, it's a really great, and, and I watched him, you know, when you work, when you work with somebody, how they work over, I moved Gonzalo. Um, yeah, maybe he's my dad, I've seen his other movies, yeah. Um, you know, you have to go back, I mean, I go back to that old school director's life. A great director died this week, Norman Jewison. Yeah. God bless you. I mean, I met Norman Jewison in the 70s. And anybody that can direct Cincinnati Kid, Thomas Crown Affair, Jesus Christ Superstar, Fiddler on the Roof, come on. And also, Al Ashby was his editor, who he then thought so highly of that he made him do a film for the landlord. So he's a real movie guy. So this week, Norman Jewison's up there. Yeah. And Justice for All is more Oh, no, that's what I meant. Well, he goes on. The list can go on, you know? We have one right here. Oh, oh, oh. oh no, you were yelling. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you were stretching. You were stretching. Yeah, right there. Uh, during one of the scenes with the kid Max, there was the iconic line, <laughs> such as life being said. Was that a deliberate choice, or was it a... Which line? Such is life. Such as life. Such as life. Such is life. Yes. Was it a deliberate choice? Oh, such is life. And that's, that's the one from Wick. Yeah, yeah yes. such is life. It's true. Yeah, okay, was the no, it's, it's your technical <laughs> reference about a line reading in the film. Yeah, yeah. Such is life. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that such wasn't is intentional. Life. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't intentional. The reference to John Wick or in the movie. In the movie. Yeah. yeah. Not my intention. No, we made it before. We made this in the script. No, we made it. What did we make with Bus Wick? No, no. <laughs> Which John Wick? There's four of us. We made it 21. No, I don't mean such is life. No, it's, it's absolutely right. Such is life. No, my favorite line. My favorite line is this: is having no lines and watching. You know, I mean, I love that scene with the great Fanny up there, mm. you know, which is so enigmatic and weird. But that's that happens in an uncomfortable situation. You go with the flow, and nobody, everybody knows that this is strange, whatever. But Nora giving that, you know, I'm watching again the relationship, I was really very touching watching that. And that, you know, the, the formalized way of 
when she died. It's like it's such a, a moment you mean. And not a big deal made of it. It's like he comes under, she comes in, he comes in. It's like you know, it's the issues. It's like, wow, well, I've created this monster, this part of me. Uh, I think that's the moment, of, you know, that's the moment of um, just what happens at the end under the waves of the, the sequence. Of the Thank God you know how to explain films all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's such a beautiful movie. I want to remind everyone it'll be in theaters starting this week. Please, you want to take one more? We'll take one more back there. Yeah, thank you. Um, were there any movies which uh, particularly inspired you in relation to, to this one? Were there were there earlier movies that you felt you know were interested in that and you want to explore that in, in this one? Movies that inspired this one. I have the tendency of forgetting about that, so I don't have a specific film that I inspire myself. I normally prefer to really keep myself away from going into specific references, so I have a more of a fresh approach. Um, but I know that probably in that time when I'm thinking about how I want to do it, every movie I watch somehow is like, oh, this works here, this doesn't work. But I really prefer normally to to talk to the director of photography and think in a naive way that we're going to try to do something that no one did before. I know everything is done, but but at least as an engine, you need to think that you're trying to do something that is uh, unique and it's going to be unique for yourself. And that's the strength that you need to go every day to to the set and, and keep building the, the movie. I don't know if anyone has ever shot an entire movie with one lens by choice before. I'm sure. I'm sure probably <laughs> did. By uh, choice. I'm, by choice. <laughs> yes. Well, again, please spread the word. It's such a special movie. Thank you so much for